This episode of Jump Off Point is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support the Boss Rush family of podcasts, head to BossRush.net or our Patreon at patreon.com slash BossRushMedia. Thanks for helping us build something better. Everybody, welcome to Jump Off Point. I'm your host, the enlightened, excited Eddie V. Joining me on this episode is the one, the only, Boston man himself, Mr. Corey Derrick. Hello, good sir. Hello, I'm trapped. Somebody save me. Ed made me do this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Hello. Hi. I'm ready to talk about things. Yes. And, <laughs> uh, and everybody, we got a fantastic content creator, uh, one of our writers from the Boss Rush writing team. You know, he is just such an awesome and amazing guy, awesome gamer, writes some great articles. He'll never make you feel pain. Everybody, please welcome Ouch! Hello, good sir. Hello, Edward. It is your buddy and your pal, Ouch. The Cosmic Castaway, the Alone and Ronin, the Garbage Ape. I'm trying intros out. I don't know. They might work. They might not. <laughs> Good to be here. Look, uh, you never you never know it's going to stick until you test it out, you know? Yeah, exactly. It's it's like the test market kitchens when they try out new fast food. <laughs> yeah. All the freak show. It's in one place. You got to try it out somewhere. So Exactly. Exactly. Yes. And everybody. It is his turn. It is his moment. Oh boy! It is his strategy that he came on the show looking fresh to death mm-hmm. from the turn by turn podcast. The one, the only Daniel. Hello, good sir. Hey, what's going on? It's so nice to finally be asked on a show that's not just video games. Like people are finally going to hear my other takes. Yeah, yes. hot takes. <laughs> I would have, I would, I would have called the show hot takes, but it's already taken by ESPN, so I can't really ah. do that. And plus, I mean, we could, we could challenge the, them. We could no, try. The, no, the I mouse mean. would come get me. The mouse would take me away. <laughs> I'd be locked in a in the mouse dungeon. <laughs> it would not be a under, mm. under Disneyland. Yeah, that's what's uh, really under there. <laughs> the, yes, you're going uh, into the gulag. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> that sounded well, like Mickey in that South Park episode. <laughs> <laughs> that's with my voice. That's about as high as I can go. So that's fine. <laughs> well, everybody, we're gonna get off. Uh, start this show off with what's jumping, jumping, and this is our play. What we've been playing, what we've been watching section. So I'm gonna jump it off. And everybody, I've been playing Octopath Traveler 2. I'm at 82 hours. I am, well, most of my characters are on Chapter 4. I'm getting closer to the end of this game. I probably got about 45 more hours to go because there's a lot of grinding that I got to do. This game is amazing. Once again, the music is probably top tier. Um and like soundtracks for 2023 like it's literally up there for a game of the year nomination just as a game itself and i'm definitely just enjoying it and everything uh i was talking to Corey uh at the like nintendo power block and everything and i told him that i cut the game off and i forgot to save so i had to redo a boss today that i fought yesterday and i was just uh, uh fought on a sunday and i was just like oh man i gotta redo this all over but uh i figured it out uh because one of my characters he could hit um uh, uh, enemy like if they're like dazed and confused he can hit an enemy and take off like twelve thousand dollars of damage so i ended up doing his the battle for like within seven minutes just like killing the uh final boss so it cut that time down i was like very happy and, and everything but uh that's what i've been playing um i'm going to be watching some of the john wick movies 
uh, to get ready for uh, John Wick 4. Uh, by the time this comes out, I have I might already seen it. And I just found out they're starting the Studio Ghibli Fan Fest of movies. And the, the week of this recording, Saturday, they're doing uh, they're doing My Never Totoro. And the first showing they're doing is the regular Japanese version with uh, subtitles. So I'm going to the movies to go watch that. They're doing 10 movies, uh, one each month. Uh, it's starting this month that, uh, uh, at the time of this recording, March. And they're ending it in November. And I definitely got to see it next month uh, because they're doing the live action version of Spirit to the Way that I've never seen. Uh, so they're doing that at a movie theater. So that's what I'll be watching uh, next month. Um, but uh, ouch! Uh, what you what's been jumping jumping on your side? Um, for me, you know, sometimes things go good, sometimes things go bad. You take it good with the bad. I got a PlayStation Five. Are you kidding me? Like, I, I don't know why I waited. It's like I was always holding back. It's just like, oh, if you get a PlayStation 5, you have to upgrade the TV because you only got a 40 inch. All the buttons to the side don't work, things like that. So it's just, it was just all this thing. So I was just like, I was having issues finally with the PlayStation 4. So I was just like, OK, this has kind of pushed me over the edge. Got it. It's already taking over as the entertainment thing. It's like I've already got the uh, the hand, a small handful of games, PlayStation Plus collection, whatever. I already got the UFC app. I got the Pluto TV app. I got YouTube on there. It has already basically replaced my Roku sans one app that I don't think has a PlayStation 5 app to it. But all of a sudden, like, oh, it's the PlayStation 5 is just amazing. Not that this is new information for anyone, but I am here to confirm completely PlayStation 5. Amazing. <laughs> oh wow that's that's awesome uh mm-hmm. anything have you been watching or anything um i am behind on my watchings i try to do a handful of stuff but that was my one theory when you figure out your hobby whether it be video games movies that's where you're stuck with don't let video games be your hobbies i'm saying that as a video game hobbyist it's just like it's everything else so much easier like if you're a movie person you go to an air-conditioned building they have tons of food and snacks you sit down for two hours you look at a screen you don't have to do anything else when you play video games it's uh 40 hours getting through a tutorial making sure your controller works making sure the gameplay works making sure all the graphics are nice does the sound work is it a longevity kind of thing is it a short term long term all this stuff and it takes so much damn time so hopefully soon I'll either watch more than likely some of the new mystery science theater is actually on Pluto TV Ooh. app. I will go to that more than likely. And I know for a fact they have an El Santo movie and those are always entertaining. So. All right. Mm-hmm. Cool. Corey, what's been jumping and jumping on your side? Uh, not PlayStation Five. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, here we go. I uh, no, I've been uh, playing some. I'm trying. So I finished. I finished Hogwarts Legacy up, and I'm trying to finish some uh, Switch games that have been kind of on hold for a while because for some reason I like to play games until the very end and then just stop playing them before I beat them. So I've been playing Super Mario 3D World. Uh because I have three levels left and uh, what nine green coins or green, what not green coins. What are they in there? The stars, right? Yeah. Yeah. The green stars left in that game. So I'm trying to finish that up. I'm also on this. I'm also trying to finish Link's awakening uh, because I was on the seventh dungeon when I stopped playing and uh, you know, there's only eight, plus the end <laughs> so uh i'm trying to finish that up and then i've also been uh continuing my quest to be the uh best disney dreamlight valley player ever to live <laughs> because nice. that's what i do so uh that's 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 me i've also been playing a lot of destiny tell me where you've heard that before um so yeah 
that's that's pretty much it. Uh, my wife and I are actually wa- watching Ted Lasso. Also, re- well, I'm rewatching the first two seasons, but she's never watched mm-hmm. it, so we're tr- we're watching it together. And uh, I'm glad we are because it's real good. Awesome, Daniel. What's been jumping in? What's been jumping in? Jumping. What's been jumping? Jumping on your side. <laughs> So many things have been leaping out of control lately, but uh, what I've been primarily playing has been Tales of Symphonia, the yes. remaster. Yes. Which, uh, it was sort of a game I always wanted when I was younger, when I first, like back in the original GameCube days, but never mm-hmm. was able to acquire it. So it's sort of like making up for horrible history by getting to play it. And it's more chibi than I kind of thought it would be. And that's not usually my favorite, but I'm, I'm getting through it. And then the combat's a little little funky, but that's been going okay. And uh, it seems like it's a good remaster. Again, only having seen like video footage of the original. Can't really speak too much to how remastered it really is, but seems good in my book. Seems like it, it's aged pretty well. So I've been having fun with that. And then I've also been playing Wargroove which is uh, essentially Advance Wars with strangely fictional kind of medieval fantasy elements to it, which has been pretty cool. You are you essentially, it like is Advance Wars. So you have like a general who has special abilities and you can summon army units throughout the course of like a tactical map. So I've been having a lot of fun watching that and playing through it as well. Uh, uh, are you get? Are you looking forward to part two? They got they got announced. Yeah, uh, of Advance Wars because that, that uh, has something coming out. Oh no! Oh, well. uh, War Groove Two. Oh yeah, I'm definitely invested enough that I want to play a follow up. The Advance Wars like reboot camp that's been coming out for like five straight years is supposedly I think actually coming out in the next few weeks. Oh, so excited. <laughs> Very curious to see that since it mainly like the hype is not built internally. It's just like the fact that it's been so long since they've put it off. And mm-hmm. it's like I'm more curious now just because of the delays rather than like the game itself. Yeah, I'm assuming they'll probably be getting into marketing mode like next week or sometime soon, like to promote this game, be like, hey. Uh, this well, is the things that you can do, and this <clears throat> then when the game comes out, they'll probably go full on hard mode. Well, if you guys have any questions, uh, we are having way forward on the Boss Rush podcast in a couple weeks, so I will. Advance Wars is at the top of the list. <laughs> oh, very cool. Mostly because of Loran, but <laughs> you know. Uh, but yeah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna talk to them about River City Girls and uh, Advance Wars, and I guess I guess Shantae too. So I made the I made the terrible mistake of, of thinking that they did the Streets of Four or the Streets of Rage Four game, and it was not them. It was Dot Emu, and that was an embarrassing email. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hey, they still said yes, right? What? They still said yes, so they did. you didn't bomb too hard. They did. They did. They left. They said, haha, it's okay. If you want to be a Patreon producer, head on over to Patreon, patreon.com slash Media, and find out which tier is right for you. Our Patreon producers at the $5 tier or higher for this month are Adriel Munger, Austin Campbell, Celeste Roberts, Christian S., Sana Dierig, Francisco Santillan, and Rebecca Jewell. Thank you for your continued support. All right, guys, it's time to point it out where we talk about what's trending on Twitter. Uh, Corey, what trend would you like to uh, talk about? All right, Ed. So at the time of this recording, obviously, John Wick is out and... Uh, the uh, Cyberpunk 2077 DLC is coming out and Keanu Reeves is trending why? I have no idea I just saw hashtag Keanu Reeves Uh, so I kind of want to talk about like 
So he he kind of has his own kind of almost character on the internet in like a like almost like in a meme capacity, but in like a good way, you know, like in. I just want to know what you guys think of Keanu Reeves. I think he's I think he's an interesting character. I think he's had like two or three resurgences in his career, right? First with mm-hmm. like obviously like Bill and Ted, Excellent Adventure and Bogus Journey and then The Matrix is probably the one that we kind of point to as like that's where he became like the big star and then you know, took a little hiatus really in terms of the spotlight, but now he's back with like John Wick and he did cyberpunk and he did the third bill Bill and Ted movie, which I hear is like actually okay. And, um, yeah, it's, he's, he's an interesting character. I just kind of want to talk about him a little bit. He, uh, I know he's doing Constantine too. And I know he's going to do a Netflix adaptation of that comic book that he wrote berserker. Uh, I just, Keanu Reeves is interesting. He's an interesting character to say the least um so thoughts on keanu reeves i'm a big matrix fan well who isn't on the matrix you know unless you start listening to andrew tate whole nother issue to to me i remember a point in time where everyone was actively making fun of keanu reeves Like, that was a weird thing, especially because he was doing the whole surfer guy kind of thing with the whole perfect voice. And then it's like, what was the movie? Interview with a Dracula? Interview with a vampire? Dracula's the name. Interview with a vampire where he like he was the vampire. So it's like, hello, I am Count Dracula. Wasn't that wasn't that Bram Bram Stoker's Dracula? Wasn't he in that? I I I am not. I am not 100 percent sure. I could have swore was interview with a vampire. Maybe it was. I've never seen an interview with a vampire, so I I don't I no. don't know. I mean, that's the only weird thing. All the like, I watch a YouTube channel called '80s Commercial Vault, but they also do like '90s commercials, '70s commercials, the whole thing. Mm-hmm. All these '90s commercials have these movies I have never freaking heard of. It's yeah. just like I uh, like I. Bram I was like you know, uh, Bram Stoker's Dracula, nineteen ninety two. Oh, it was Bram Stoker's. Mm-hmm. Then who the hell was an interview with a vampire? Who am I thinking that of that? Was, I mean, uh, in that? And Christian Slater, I know, is in that. Okay. But, okay. I'm I mean, off, I've never seen it, though, usual. so I, whatever. <laughs> it's fine. We're all as usual, But yeah, that, that's the thing. Like, I recall, you know, everyone was making fun of uh, T- Keanu Reeves because he was kind of a character actor more than anything else, you know. Him mm-hmm. trying to show off some acting chops. Understood, you kind of want to grow as an actor and things like that. But everyone was just going, no, it's Bill or Ted. And so it's like they never really gave him a pass. I think it was when he had to switch to action, mm-hmm. like action movies and action roles. So that kind of gives you a break, a pass, because now you're flipping around oh, with guns. Break? Yeah, you no. Nah. Oh, hold on. There we go. All right. So, but no, you go into action, you kind of give a pass because you're doing this crazy bombastic stuff. So, and now it's just kind of stuck. He probably needs the goatee to keep with that, but I have nothing against him anymore. It just seems to be, you know, nothing super, super offensive just because he's like, he seems ultra cool outside of like the Hollywood part. You know what I mean? That's, Mm -hmm. that is always nice to hear yeah. now there are probably you are probably there's probably one guy out there going dude he flipped me off in traffic keanu reeves is a jerk you know that's bound to happen but as far as i know or and have heard he seems to be a decent guy yeah mm-hmm. yeah i uh he he was on uh what was he on the other day he was on something the other day pr- uh promoting john wick and he was just like yeah, I went into this sandwich shop and I bought a sandwich and everybody was like, oh my gosh, he beats sandwiches like us. I'm just like, oh, we all got to go to the sandwich shop now. Tom, yeah. Keanu Reeves is there. I keep wanting to call him yes. Tom Cruise. That's completely different. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he might play Tom Cruise. What if it, Keanu Reeves and Tom Cruise were in a movie together at some point? I, You know what? You say that 
Keanu Reeves is just Tom Cruise with a goatee. I've never yes. seen them in the same place at the same time. You are not wrong. Mm-hmm. Point for ouch. Wow. <laughs> and, He's almost uh, sort of timeless, uh, like Paul Rudd in a way. Yeah. Where like he just sort of exists outside the stream of time. It's true. Although, he, he really does. He just kind of he doesn't age. I mean, so okay, so I don't know if you guys saw the newest Matrix movie or not, but they do show him shave, like he shaved his beard and his goatee and stuff. He when he shaves, he does look old. Does so he? the hair okay. is like covering up his oldness, but still, man, it's usually the reverse. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we got, uh, let's see, The Devil's Advocate, Point Break, Speed, the John Wick oh, movies. Speed, classic. <laughs> the Matrix, uh, Constantine. Matrix. I think with with Keanu Reeves, it's just like, uh, you know, definitely when he was introducing Cyberpunk at the Xbox E3. And and what he said like you're special or something like that. I no, think you're, you're beautiful. beautiful. Oh, you're breathtaking. You're breathtaking. Beautiful. Breathtaking. Damn it! Yeah. There goes my point. <laughs> uh, well. You're breathtaking and stuff. <laughs> and I think it was just you know definitely with John Wick helping his career, he's get like getting back to it. And definitely with the way that John Wick is more of a stylish action movie to see that he was in. Uh, I think there was just like a new love for him and everything because mm-hmm. it, it's kind of had that Matthew McConaughey kind of feel to it where, mm-hmm. you know, Matthew McConaughey was like in just some weird stuff, but there's something about when you see him on TV, his interviews and his presence and stuff, he has this, you know, country laid back philosophical weirdness to him, but yet it's, entertaining to watch and listen to and that's kind of like how keanu reeves is you know he embraced like tiktok like you know mm-hmm. he'll do videos like when you're sad and, and everything or he'll you know try to be encouraging are those him stuff. though or are those deep fakes i thought those were deep fakes i think that was him i don't know it looked like that where that he's like him. dancing in the kitchen and stuff kind of yeah no those are deep fakes man oh <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They're really, they're really good deep fakes. They're but. really good, but I'm like, you know, uh, but it's I think like just with Keanu, something about him is just like seeing him. He is great to watch. He's very entertaining. Yeah, he has that surfer vibe to him, you know. But I think it's really, really entertaining because you know it makes him, it makes him feel real and stuff. And everything, mm-hmm. just be like, man, that's a cool person, and I know people like that, and so I could be relatable to it and everything. So I think you know, Keanu Reeves is he's trending definitely because of Job Week Four. Everybody cannot wait to see what he does, and like, um, maybe people find him also sexy and everything. You know, that might be a reason that he's trending and stuff. So uh, I love Keanu Reeves. I love his work. Um, he's good. He's he was great in Devil's Advocate. He was great in The Matrix, and uh, he's so good in the John Wick movies uh, and, and everything. So uh, yeah, I can't I, wait to definitely see John Wick four. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I I'm actually like seeking out. So I I I saw John Wick one, and I really liked it a lot. And then I never saw I never saw the rest of them. So like I'm going to I want to rewatch all of those movies. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think the movie that like really got me into like, I I don't know, action movies, I guess was the matrix. And I mean, obviously I think for a lot of people in their early to mid thirties, like the matrix was like this turning point of movies, right? Like that, that mm-hmm. movie was full of action and cool kind of, CG effects that really worked and obviously like the bullet time thing though it wasn't new in the matrix they made it like they made it super and popular and that's why it's called bullet time because the matrix just used bullets to show off the effect yeah yeah and so like i mean that that whole that movie and like i mean the sequels the sequels were fine but that first movie is like that is a top 
10 or even top five movie for me of all time. Like, and Mm -hmm. not that I'm like the biggest movie buff or anything, but like, man, that movie is so good. And like, I think Keanu Reeves was like a big part of that, you know, like I know Kung Fu, you know, like that, I mean that, that whole thing, I mean, he doesn't sound like that in the movie, but like it's, I'm an FBI essentially, federal agent. <laughs> it, it's uh, he's so that whole, that role is just so iconic. And like, even the things he's done after that have been super iconic, right? Like John wick is so it's, I think any actor would really, do anything to play such an icon like one iconic character that would make their career right i mm-hmm. you know i mean obviously sometimes I, actors get like greedy or they w- want to do other things or whatever when they know they're good but like i think for the most part an actor would kill to have one iconic character right and i kind of think keanu reeves i mean keanu reeves has made two or three pretty iconic characters in his career right ted and uh ted neo neo constantine and, and, john wick yeah like he has a whole <laughs> roster full of of these characters and now like obviously on the gaming side it's johnny silverhand right like yeah pretty iconic characters right and i think the only like the one person and this is kind of like a side <laughs> i don't know how you get there get here from there but like the only person i can really compare him to is like harrison ford you know with like the how top tier his iconic characters are, you know, I mean, obviously okay. Harrison Ford is uh, Indiana Jones, Han Solo, uh, you know, the president. <laughs> Get off my plane! Uh, you know, I mean, but, you know, I mean, he like he he did so many iconic things too, and like I kind of think, I mean, obviously their personalities are entirely different, <laughs> entirely different because Harrison Ford is just the grumpy old man. <laughs> in hollywood now but (laughs) like it's just it's fun i'm I'm glad that someone as seemingly good as keanu reeves has gotten that uh kind of recognition at this point Mm -hmm. you know it's it's interesting because we think of actors as like being good actors when they like deliver these like like really big speeches or like have like amazing dialogue with Keanu Reeves, it's almost like the less he talks, the more people seem to like him. Mm-hmm. Where like he takes on these like physical, like he's very physical in his roles. Mm-hmm. So like that physicality is his way of acting. Because like when he when he talks, he does have that kind of like I know kung fu sort of like space out. Mm-hmm. So like a lot of his like acting kind of like chops seem to come from like his physic physicality rather than like. DiCaprio's speech in Django Unchained or something that like really like sticks out. Yeah. And it's funny. I don't I don't know if you guys have ever looked this up, but there's there's a video. Uh there's a YouTube video of just every and every movie or whatever. Like it's it's probably like a four or five minute video of Keanu Reeves just saying, Yeah. In like all of his movies. <laughs> but it, it's like all different movies <laughs> where he does that. <laughs> I great. thought I thought he did one with Whoa too. Yeah, because uh, that well, was a popular one with him. Yeah, yeah. Whoa, yeah, I, yeah. That's there's one of those two out there. I'm sure too. You know, I, I, mean, of... I mean, it's the equivalent. It's the equivalent to the Owen Wilson. Wow, you know, like it's wow. just yeah. I kind of yeah. want to make a top ten modern action movie list because I know definitely for me, yes, Keanu Reeves would be on it. But I think like if I made a list, majority it would be Jason Statham on there. Mm-hmm. Like the well, all you gotta do is put what four or five Fast and the Furious movies, Crank and uh, Transporter on there, and there you go. Crank is good though. Crank is bunkers good. <laughs> that also fight the on shark, the... the shark movie that he's in. Yeah, the Mag where he, he fights sharks. He punches yeah. sharks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, ouch. Uh, mm-hmm. what? Whoa. What are you... what? We're moving on already. Yes, ouch. Gotta start talking about this trend. Oh. Oh, do you want to put a button is... you want to put a button in keanu reeves or uh, yeah i mean no i i i don't know i i was just I defeat keanu whatever. reeves it was, it was a great it was a great topic okay That's all. good all right ouch uh what is shredded on your side so for me the other day 
over in Disneyland was the reopening of Toontown. They finally have mm. everything opened up. Not with them installing the new ride of Mickey and Minnie's Runaway Railway. If you ever get the time or the chance, look up a POV of this ride. I wrote like, it. You wrote like, it? Well, Is it it's, ama- it's been open at Disney World for a couple years now. Right. Uh, and yeah, I wrote it. It's does, uh, no cell phone camera does that justice. There is so much going on. The technology is crazy. It's that is probably one of the most amazing rides I have seen in a long time. It's uh, I feel like you need to be on some sort of drugs when you go in there to ride it, because like there's so much going there. Like you said, there's so much going on on the in that ride that it's just kind of like, oh, my gosh, that, where do I look? What do I do? And like it's. <laughs> They kind of designed it for the building at Disney World because a lot of the rooms actually have because it used to be the great movie ride. Yes. And uh, a lot of the rooms have themes that of the previous scene that used to be in there during the great movie ride, like the room, like uh, the Wizard of Oz room. Yes. Has a tornado. tornado Yes. exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so I wonder how that translates to Disneyland, actually. Yeah. You know what? I saw a video. The biggest change seems to be their pre-show is now based on um, like Mickey's film history, like all the shorts, like you have like the props from all of his things. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, like the beanstalk from Jack and the Beanstalk is growing up in the middle of the place. You have like uh, Mickey's chair in Mickey's Christmas Carol, even though that's mm-hmm. more about Mr. Scrooge. Figure that one out. But it has all these like Mickey props outfits things like that so it's more a mickey history kind of thing and then you get to the part where you enter the ride and then it seems to be a carbon copy i watched videos they both seem ride wise completely the same like even like mostly even in layout in terms like you still see all the same scenes there's not a whole lot changed about that Mm -hmm. so but it is one of those things i am now amazed by theme park technology like all of these rides are now basically becoming trackless rides. They're all based mm-hmm. on uh, programs and radio signals that now just guide a char- chariot is not the right term. Don't care. It just guides you through, you know, the Phantom Manor and it's turning where you are supposed to look. And it's like the animatronics have now just jumped in quality trackless ride systems. Mickey Minnie's Runaway w- Railway is it looks like everything's a screen, except you would go, there's no screen for a jagged edge for that. That has to be custom made. I know it's a lot of projections more than anything, especially, but it's one of those things where Walt Disney would be going, holy crap, look at all this stuff. So it's yeah. just, I think, you know, Disneyland does not get credit for being technologically savvy because, mm-hmm. you know, you have all these rides that are super futuristic and stuff. And then you go to like the haunted mansion or something, and it's still just an old a dummy rocking in a chair. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Using Pepper's ghost across the street. So yeah. So anyone who's I think you've probably been here to Disney the most recent, right, Corey? Yeah. When uh we went in November. And November. uh yeah, so we we went to Disney World. It's funny because like as as many times as I've been to Disney World in my life, I've never been to Disneyland. Mm-hmm. And uh, like that's like that's one of my bucket list things is to get, go to Disneyland uh, yeah. someday. But like, yeah, I mean, you said it like just <laughs> I always love a good classic ride like Pirates of the Caribbean. Right. is just a, such a classic attraction. But like all those animatronics are just <laughs> they're older they're, than dirt in there. They're rough point. now. They're yeah. really rough. And every now and again, you'll see videos that people will grab and the robots just stuck there. Mm-hmm. Yo, ho, yo. <laughs> oh, like they didn't they didn't stop to fix it that day. Nope. And it's just like and you just look like, well, that just takes you out of the experience. So, yeah. But, but then you get on something like like the Frozen ride where like the all the characters are like the brand new kind of. Uh, well, they, I guess within the last like 10 years. A 1000, I want to say they're all electric and pneumatic and not hydraulic. So you have 
yeah <laughs> like, fluid motions and exactly. like exactly it's it's it, really incredible i don't know if you've i don't know if you've ever looked up the stuff that's going on in china but they revealed the new uh elsa animatronic and like mm-hmm. they now have like gears and stuff in her face to where they don't have to project it and it's just a full on that's that like look it cool. up dude it looks that's- it looks incredible. It's, I'm sure it is. It sounds creepy as shit, too. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it is. Because, it looks yeah, real. Yeah, take, take, take the skin off. It's a Five Nights at Freddy's robot all of a sudden. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, so, like, <laughs> to be fair, some of those animatronics look like that anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. The thing with me with Disney, uh, me and Corey yeah. had this discussion before, is that he's a Disney person. I'm a Six Flags guy, kind of guy. Okay, fair I enough, love fair the enough. roller coasters. I love the thrills and stuff. I, don't get me wrong. I, I, they, but they don't have like the third of roller coasters like Six Flags have. And don't get me wrong. I've been to Disneyland and Disney World um, in the past. I haven't been there lately or anything. And I think they're really cool parts, really like for children and for families and stuff. Um, uh, but yeah, I'm just a six flats kind of person. I I love to go upside down. I love the high in the air drops and like the wooden technology and everything. Like I love that rush. And I think Disney for me is great to go. It's it's probably fun to get on the rides, but I feel like definitely for me, I won't get anything out of it because my body's gonna be craving. You need to get on a roller coaster. Mm. You need to hit a drop. That, you need to hit well, a turn or something. That's you clearly that's haven't complete. Ridden Tower of Terror or <laughs> Rock and Roller Coaster or the new Guardians of the Galaxy ride, which is pretty cool. No, I'm just kidding. I, I mean, that, that, I com- I completely understand that thrill thrills are not quite a Disney thing. It is the setting, the immersion, the bringing you into the land itself. Yes. So that I kind of get because like they, again, I love me some random trivia. The world's I could this could be beat. You know, I have to quote me. The world's Disney has the world's most expensive roller coaster in Expedition Everest. That was that's the biggest one Disney has. I want to say sixty million dollars to make. Most of it is building this giant animatronic Yeti that's in the ride. That doesn't work, by the way. <laughs> that, spoiler alert, Corey! Come on, like that's right. the whole point. They spent a lot of money, like, and th- like there were like Discovery Channel would always do like some theme park specials, and this was one of the things. And so it's like, so it's a giant. A giant Yeti holding on, reaching out, grab you, trying to grab you. And as it turns out, if it kept trying to grab you, it would pull the building apart. So they had to stop it. So now the Yeti is just frozen in time. They do a strobe light effect on it, which is now given it the name Disco Yeti. So Mm. when you get the chance, go look at the Disco Yeti that is now stuck in time until they have to refurb that which probably mm-hmm. means they would have to completely demolish the ride because he is so built into the system, but mm-hmm. they were using the software to design it. Someone forgot to move a decimal point, and now we're stuck with a broken robot that we're never going to fix. I actually think that ride is scheduled for refurbishment this summer, to be honest with you. <laughs> yeah, they ain't going to fix the robot. They ain't no, going to fix the robot. No, they, they can fix the track. That's perfectly fine. And for safety purposes, they should, but... They ain't fixing that robot. Yeah. <laughs> what about what about you, Daniel? What do you think about Disney as a theme park? In- theme park specifically. So specifically as a theme park, my experience the last time I was there was about twenty six years ago. So this might be a slightly dated opinion, but um, mm-hmm. yeah. I seem to really re- in, remember enjoying a Star Wars ride, <laughs> the po- the post Disney era Star Wars, the original ride. And the Jurassic Park ride. So I don't know if I have any current relevant information here, but um, you know what? The last time I went was like 1995 when like Epcot ooh. had the Barbie stage show. Okay. Mm. Which I have seen. So confused. So I'm, I might, I'm, I, everything I look at Disney now is through YouTube and like theme park channels, you know? So mm. completely in the yeah. same realm. Last time I've been past then, because that's about when I was there. <laughs> yeah, I, last time I've been to I've been to Disney World in 1999 because it was a, a school trip for my choir. We got to sing at Epcot, 
Uh, that was my last time at Disney World. Disneyland, I was there in 1989 uh, <laughs> in California. That's the last <sighs> time. And then I just, I'd never been, had a, my family, my mom, like she took my the grandkids and stuff to Disney in Florida. But I just haven't, you know, made any plans or trips to go to Disney. I want to go because of Earl's Sandwich. You know, mm. Corey talks about it. Um and I have seen some good food that happens at Disney, so I got to get in touch with a travel oh, agent man, and Earl of get that all is together. The best. I want to try one so bad. Oh, it's the best. So. I definitely would like to go, particularly now that they do have like Guardians of the Galaxy and mm-hmm. Marvel stuff now. That's yeah. one of my other like big things, comics. So, see, seeing that in real life would be pretty cool. Yeah, the, I, I, the Marvel. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, you go ahead. the The Marvel stuff is over at California Adventure. It it doesn't seem to get as much favoritism as does like Galaxy's Edge or like you know Toontown just got refurbished. I think it's just because they basically took over Tower of Terror. It's now you know Guardians of the Galaxy Cosmic Rewind. It's the same ride, but it's now with Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm-hmm. It was already open and there. So it does not have that pop of like a brand new ride at Disney World at the new Marvel Land. Like they got they got some, but not much. And it's just like then you also it's just buildings. You know what I mean? There's no like giant set pieces like Pandora at Animal Planet. They made Pandora and it looks like it's got floating islands and it's freaking crazy. You know, the Marvel campus just seems to be. Oh, hey, look, a Neo construction building, you know, it's like, oh, interesting. So I guess yeah. I could settle for Galaxy's Edge. Yeah. If I had to. The, the thing about the, about Disney World, too, is that like they are not allowed to use Marvel because uh, it's weird. They, there's like this weird contract where the Disney theme parks can't use Marvel east of the Mississippi and any theme park west of the Mississippi and within something like i don't know 75 miles 50 miles can't use you know the marvel and they specifically worded that contract because i think they're like 50 or i don't i don't know what the distance between disneyland and universal studios hollywood is but it's like Mm -hmm. whatever that distance is plus one (laughs) mile right and that's why (laughs) disneyland can use marvel but uh disney world cannot use the avengers or the x-men but mm. they can use the cosmic stuff, which is why Guardians of the Galaxy is there. But also, they're not allowed to use the brand Marvel. So, like, when you see the Guardians of the Galaxy ride, it doesn't say Marvel anywhere, except for, like, the toys mm. in the gift shop. Okay. It just says Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, but so, that man. probably explains why they do a lot of Pixar stuff in yeah. Disney World. Okay. That that explains I'm, a lot, actually. I'm assuming a lot of those contracts probably got to expire before they could do anything. Well, well, the thing is, is Disney bought Marvel be- after the Universal contract. Yeah. Right. So that's kind of that's what I'm. Yeah, that's what I'm. Want, I'm saying like after those contracts expire, mm-hmm. I think things will change. Yeah, I w- I wonder when those contracts ex- will expire, or if Disney will just outright buy out universal i mean it's going to be a p- billions of dollars but i think they're going to want to start doing something just because like a lot of those parks are going to start hitting renovations soon mm-hmm. like the magic kingdom and animal kingdom specifically are getting major overhauls the next couple of years like 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 they're working on epcot right now or they're mm-hmm. at least in the middle slash finishing up so they, it's supposed to be done by this fall but the magic kingdom is supposed to add Encanto. Coco and a villain's land. And the only place they can put it is where Tom Sawyer's Island is. <laughs> and it's like, well, <laughs> considering Take... what era of time we live in, Tom Sawyer Island probably isn't very relevant in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Well, so, no, that's the thing. Yeah. They changed, you know, they, they, again, Walt Disney said Disneyland will never be finished. So mm-hmm. you have, you know, all the stuff they have to up and, you know, Splash Mountain is closed because they're replacing it with um, Frog Princess. Uh, you know, all these things. So like Swiss Family Robinson's Treehouse is Tarzan's Treehouse. And even that's dated by this ta- by this point mm-hmm. in time now. It's still so, Swiss Family Robinson's Treehouse in Disney World. Oh, really? 
Yeah. They, not, they didn't change that. Okay. No, I did no, not they, know that. They, so they, it's funny. They closed it. And like a lot of people thought it was going to be a Moana themed tr- like adventure when mm-hmm. they closed it and they reopened it and it was still Swiss Family Robinson. And people were That's... like, what are you doing? Nobody cares about this stuff anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, 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 depends on depends on the ride. Like when they were closing Mr. Toad's Wild Ride at Disney World, oh. people were like protesting that. Don't don't get me started on Mr. Toad, man. <laughs> Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. <laughs> It's still open in Disneyland though, so oh man. Yeah, they opened freaking Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, that's a that's a weird call. So especially on that. Just oh yeah. the weird things I nerd out about, I can nerd out about, but that's what I saw in trending. All right. Love that topic. Daniel. Ouch is my new best friend. Company Daniel. retreat. To Disney. One to Disney. One. <laughs> oh jeez. No, we have Daniel. to go to Super Nintendo World. We have to like I've seen. I'm that. too big. You're too big. Oh, you're too big. Yeah, Daniel. What is trending? They Daniel, do. what is trending hold on, on your hold on. side? Time out. Hold on. I need to what? answer Alch's question. Yes. Like, there's yes. actually like a size limit mm-hmm. on. Yeah. On, on the uh, Mario Kart. Mario Kart specifically, there's a size limit. Really? Oh, uh, uh-huh. that doesn't seem like it. A... You can't be taller than. Six foot three, which I clear. I'm I'm six five, and uh, you can't have a a waist size of over forty inches. You, I think they're doing same. There's something along the same lines for that Tron grid mm-hmm. run as six well. Five is six five is the limit. Wow, that seems. Now, apparently, they have not heard of this place called America. We're all fat and big, so. <laughs> so good luck with that one it's fine i'll sit on the side and eat my hot pretzel and mickey ice cream and dole whip yeah and dole whip (laughs) all 572 flavors of it now and and all 72 dollars of it yep all right all right right, ed go ahead daniel what is trending on your side so one thing i saw trending was uh zachary levy whose uh, movie Shazam came out this past weekend and kind of bombed pretty hard financially that I think is pretty interesting because it's like this weird combination of like, I haven't seen the movie, so if you guys have, chime in, but kind of like a very like mid movie, not too much hype about the movie itself. And then like James Gunn kind of lit all all the rest of the, the movies that have to come out on fire by announcing like this whole new slate of things that are not Shazam and like very little chance of Shazam showing up. So it's like super interesting to me that like the box office was bad. The director was like, yeah, I knew the box office was going to be trash. Mm -hmm. So it's. Oh yeah. The director like really trashed the, the, not the movie itself, but just like, he was like, yeah, I knew it was going to do bad. So that's why I took my money up front or something yeah (laughs) the director's like gaslighting the movie at this point james gunn kind of like gaslit the movie and like so there's three other dc movies coming out this year that have nothing to do with like the james gunn like announcement of Mm -hmm. stuff that's uh aquaman and the missing something uh a blue beetle movie which is not really like that high level of a character and then like the Flash movie where like Ezra Miller's like going around like grooming kids and all kinds of other like really horrible things. So it's just like really bizarre. Well, I think that's going on with a lot of um, superhero movies because like Ant-Man 3 that came out that somewhat I think bombed. Like people didn't enjoy it. Mm-hmm. They thought it was okay, but well, it wasn't I... a like a big hit or anything. I... I think I think <laughs> I think people didn't go see Shazam. I I think a lot of people really liked that first one though, right? Like from what yeah. I've heard, mm-hmm. I think people like with this whole DC change. I feel like people aren't going to see them because they're like, why would I get invested in this universe if it's going away? And we don't know who's a part of it and who's you know who's still a part of it. And you know, I guess it all kind of depends on this Flash movie, right? But like, I I wonder if people didn't go see it because they just. They just don't want to get invested in something that they think might be going away. And that's I, I think that's the problem with I, these uh, 
movie universes in general, right? Like, especially DC, where they kind of started backwards at, <laughs> in in all honesty. But like, still, I mean, even the Marvel stuff is like, I'm not. I I loved Marvel up until Endgame, right? And then after Endgame, mm-hmm. like I was kind of marveled out, and even the things that I've been watching from it because I feel like, excuse me. I mean, I wait till it all comes to Disney Plus, but like I'm I'm kind of invested, but like my I've kind of just like tuned out of like what's coming and whatnot. And yeah, there's exceptions like I'm really excited for the Deadpool Wolverine movie because I love the X-Men movies, even though most of them are pretty bad. And uh, I really liked the Deadpool movies. So I'm like, yeah, I really want to see Ryan Reynolds and Hugh Jackman just, you know, tear shit up. Right. Like, I want to see that. So I think. I think most of it's with the marketing because, like, I don't think she's like Shazam. It kind of feels like Shazam only got about maybe a week or two weeks of marketing, and then it came out. They were like, they I showed a trailer had... during the Super Bowl. They yeah. did, but I was just like, I for some unknown reason, it just felt like I didn't even know that two was happening at the point, and I didn't know there was a release date or anything. You would you would think that they would go out and just like really kind of market this movie and it just feels like no like there was no market behind it, it even with like, a little bit with ant-man and stuff just like i remember superhero movies used to be have like a big market with traders and actors and just and people know that the movie is coming that it's out go see it uh let's do some fair reactions or whatever who saw it like i thought they would do something like that and you just don't see that anymore yeah, I feel like I saw like forty billion Ant Man spots of him, like jumping and screaming and stuff. But um, yeah, it's definitely really mellowed out after Endgame, where mm-hmm. it's like I haven't like I've started the Disney Plus things and made it like halfway through and just didn't have like the motivation to want to go back and finish them. Yeah. So like I've started like probably half of those and not finished. <laughs> yeah, them. I think I watched. I think I watched. Uh, we watched uh WandaVision like <laughs> six months after it came out because we were just so well. I was just like so marveled out, and like my wife isn't like invested in any of it. You know, she's just, she just doesn't care. Uh, I mean, she likes certain things, but she's not like, oh, we gotta go see whatever, <laughs> uh, whatever movie's coming next. You know, it's like, uh, but I we really liked. WandaVision and I really liked Falcon and the Winter Soldier but like everything after that was just kind of like like I didn't I didn't like Loki at all and I know a lot of people really liked Loki but I was like this this is this is where you're gonna lose me (laughs) is like I don't care about the multiverse these are the characters that you've established that I like and like yeah hints at the multiverse are interesting but like if you're gonna form a whole thing around this like man I didn't finish what if I didn't she hulk was pretty bad like i just i couldn't get in any of it and you know i i just think after endgame both both sides marvel and dc just people were kind of i think a lot of people thought endgame was a nice conclusion in that you know i'm done now and then mm-hmm. i think spider-man was like a, an anomaly because like you're like oh i remember those movies when i was younger mm-hmm. and now they're all the spider men are spider manning together, you know, like I, I, that was, that was a cool movie, but I didn't, I didn't watch it because I was invested in what was going on, going on with, with spider or with the Marvel. I, I just, I liked the Tobey Maguire movies at the time. And it was like, that was cool to see them both. You know, I even liked the first Andrew Garfield Spider-Man movie a lot, but I don't know, man. I just, I feel every time Marvel says something now, I don't even care what they say. Like I'm just uninvested. And I think, I mean, Marvel, I mean, Bob Iger and Kevin Feige came out recently and said, they're pushing a lot of Marvel stuff back because there's just too much of it. They both said that Mm -hmm. Uh, to the point where instead of five TV shows this year, we're getting two, you know, we're getting secret invasion and uh, the, uh, What's the other one? Oh, Loki season two this year, and that's it. That's it. And uh, I think I think people's interest in them just kind of just dropped. Yeah, I like I, I and I think it's just 
you know, because I like the last Suicide Squad. I, even the one with Will Smith in it. Like, I love those. I enjoyed those two. But, like, the last Suicide Squad with John Cena being in it, I'm like, I thought that was really, really cool. It was really good. Um, and I, did, I haven't seen The Batman, but I know people said that one was a great movie. And, like, I don't know. Something about DC's, like, uh, live adaptations, I kind of fell off. Or I'm going to be late to them, where I still like their animated movies. Um, and with Marvel, it's just I don't know. Like, like you said, Corey, at the end game, at the Avengers end game, and after seeing like Guardians of the Galaxy, it's just like, what else do I'm looking for that I want to see? Because to me personally, like for Marvel, and I know I'll get a lot of words for this, I want to see a new Punisher movie. Like, it's coming. Wanna... Yeah, he's gonna. Yeah, he's going to be in... Well, he's going to be in the Daredevil show, and he's going to be in Armor Wars. But I want a, just a full-on Punisher movie. Like, straight you'll, Punisher. I think you'll get it. Like, I don't want it as a TV. I don't want it as... I mean, yeah, the TV show was good, but I'm like, I want another, like, something like Punisher Warzone that is stylish, <laughs> that looks like a comic book, but it's like... We talked about Keanu Reeves being in action movies and, you know, seeing these cool action parts. Punisher Warzone, that's kind of crazy choreographed action that I want to see. I want to see something bunkers that would make me like, whoa, I haven't seen this, uh, had this feeling in a long time. Like, I want to see that from Marvel if they're going to be, you know, in something. Or if DC do it, I want to see some well choreographed, awesome fights um, in it. Don't give me this three hour monologue of a story that you're going to be dragging on. I don't, I don't care for any of that. I want to see some, I can't wait to see action. I want to see some good pace action and make it really good. And I kind of feel like maybe that's what's happening with a lot of these uh, superhero movies. I feel like, that's probably have fallen fallen onto the wayside, and it's just trying to be so story driven, but it's just too much. We don't need a three hour experience. If you want to do two hour, that's fine, but give us a good tight hour, thirty hour, forty experience of a superhero movie and keep it moving. Uh-huh. It it is the thing with the Marvel movies. A lot of it is how can we miss you if you don't go away. Mm-hmm. Like, like Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man, probably like the best character just because it made it like smart, funny. It had the superhero elements, which, you know, when it came out at the time, wasn't quite fully sold at the box office. It was iffy because it was everything before you had. I think some of the X-Men movies were out early. That was about it. And those were iffy. They weren't like full like colorful bright action a little bit but it mm-hmm. is that thing it's like his character is great mm-hmm. is it great now or has it not evolved yet you know what i mean if it's just the same snarky alcoholic billionaire you know if he doesn't grow or learn anything he basically becomes bad like this b- bad example i think they did a study of like r- wrestling sp- that I know sometimes it gets socked in the writer's room because of Josh, but they said that John Cena was the worst character on TV. He didn't learn anything. He always won. It made his character uninteresting. So it's that thing of like, if you do not evolve, you're going to die. And I think, how do you, how do you replace the, uh, the master of thugonomics? It, it, that's what they're trying to deal with now and they really haven't like they've done some better stuff but that's the thing like you know he's gone and now they're struggling to make st- stars at least they probably have made mm-hmm. a lot of money now mostly from over for overseas shows but that's kind of the thing like you have all these characters that are all set in their ways and you know what to expect from them in the movie how many movies are you going to make then with nobody changing? That's the only thing. Mm -hmm. So I think we're going to hit a real fast dropping point with basically any superhero things. Cause like what the hell makes Shazam special? Like you say Shazam, I don't know what his powers are. Like I've seen the suit. Like I remember the trailers for the first movie. He was doing literally a Marvel character where he was like snarky, but still had superpowers. And then, 
the the few ads I saw for Shazam 2, he was all serious and brooding now. So it's just what flip of the coin manic depressive events are we going through here now? It's just like I think that snarkiness effect as well people are just going okay can we just be honest and real about this that's like we don't need jokes every single third line in this movie so i think we're getting real tired of it real fast and i think especially you know with the pandemic stopping stuff throughout i think you're going to see a lot more either breaks or even probably even characters dropped if they just go, okay, no one liked this crap. You know what I mean? So, And I, I, I think for me, I want to see some Japan studios take on DC and Marvel characters and make like an hour and a half movie at the theaters. Like, a, like give me a Ninja, a Ninja Scroll style Iron Fist movie and just go straight bunkers with it. Yeah, it's going to be a little bit of dark, but I'm like, that's what I want to see. I want someone to do a new take on American comics. They did that. It's called Demon, the, the Demon One, whatever the hell it's called. But a lot of those, that's they tried that. It was called Cowboy Bebop on Netflix, and no one gave a shit. So, <laughs> yeah. But 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 that's a, that's a Japanese one to turn it to an American thing. That's... I'm talking about taking an American comic, Marvel, something from Marvel, something from Super uh, DC, and Japan straight animates it. Like, literally, Japan does their own take or, or, or do something and, put it, and literally put it in the theater. Like, don't make America make it. Make Let Jap- Japanese animation animators really go in and do something that's like on the level of Gundam or Neon Genesis uh, uh, Evangelion Evangelion like go bunkers with it you know like hey if you even if you want to do like what Street Fighter was back in the 90s or or (laughs) something like literally go in take those characters and animate it and make it look so detailed that people will be like Oh, Japan did this. Madhouse did this. Oh, let me go see this. Uh, and 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 if they they'd be like, come away, uh, like surprised by it, or come away and be like, dude, y'all need to go see this. Uh, this take on this Marvel or this DC uh character that this Japanese uh animated studios did. People will go and watch because it's something new. It's not all CG. It's not like drivel mess of a story and narration it's really literally something different you know that's what i would love to see i think like marvel rather than trying to do something kind of off the wall like that their idea was like you guys love iron man what if we gave you 14 million iron men what you like doctor strange oh boy we've got more doctor strange for you and get this it's not the same one Hmm. 14 different Doctor Stranges and then with DC it just seems that the strategy is like start again every year and a half (laughs) it's like please like something please and then in the case of Sam the production team was just like let's try to make this as unappealing as possible (laughs) where you have like actresses being like I just wanted a like I needed a job. That's why I did Shazam too. Like, I, and I feel like with DC, there's they're more of a cinematography kind of look to them with DC. Where I think with Marvel, it is that comic book action pack stuff, but it's like so CG and everything that you could tell the difference uh, between them. Where you know, like DC is going for a darker look so they the cinematography is trying to present that darker look to me and not so much marvel but that's just my take on it yeah i think i mean i think i think the big thing is that you know i think everybody's uh, it's it's the traditional kind of hollywood thing where like you see success somewhere and then you got to go copy it real fast and you don't care how fast you get there and and you know, it had a real negative effect on DC. And and I think if they would have just slowed down and said, hey, OK. After Man of Steel, which I actually liked Man of Steel, I thought it was I thought it was pretty OK. Uh, I like I that movie. Let's let's do the Aquaman movie. Let's do the Batman movie and 
literally like copy the Avengers instead of going backwards. Like it's okay if you do it right, I think, because I I do think they did do enough different initially, at least to say, hey, yeah, okay, we're building our own DCEU, but we're darker. We're taking a little bit more serious. Uh, It's way more action and kind of, you know, we're trying to tell a different type of story here. Some of our stuff's going to be rated R like they really did try to do something different. And, you know, if they would have just taken their time and, and not rushed things and maybe stuck to Zack Snyder's vision, I don't know. I, I'm not a hundred percent sold on Zack Snyder as a director, mm-hmm. but I think if they would have maybe just kept to his vision or something like they could have maybe had something. And now again, James Gunn said there's a 10 year plan. And it's like, well, you said that like 10 years ago and it didn't go anywhere, <laughs> you know, like, right. I don't know. It's, it's like, it's a, like it's all a 10 year plans. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, everybody, that's going to be it for, uh, pointed out. We're going to get into our boss rush better topic. And this one comes from Josh Martinez. Do you prefer innovation or, or traditionalism in your video games. And I'm going to break down kind of like the definitions of them. Uh, uh, Traditionalism is the upholding or maintenance of tradition, especially so as to resist change. Innovation is the action or process of innovating. Uh, Innovation is crucial to the continued success of any organization or something. A new method, idea, product. Um, So... Uh, mm. You guys can read this Boss Rush Bitter on BossRush.net. So let's get into it, guys. Um, mm. What what do you prefer when it comes to you playing in or even purchasing your video games? Do you like a game to be follow a set tradition? Or are you willing to look out and find games that's more innovative? Yeah, and it's design, gameplay, um, even if it's like a new IP that's like doing something completely different. Mm-hmm. Uh, Daniel, I'm going to start with you. Yeah, so I think as a primarily retro gamer, I guess I'd have to say tradition. But um, I guess it depends on like what's being innovated. So I'm a Fire Emblem fan. So traditional Fire Emblem games are your grid maps and you fight the map and then the story kind of happens in the map. So when three houses came out, that's like totally different where like you have your grid map battles, but then you're walking around doing like random educational things where you're, you're learning how to use a spear. And I I was able to adapt to that. So I think it can be good, but not if it's just sort of squeezed in randomly. Like if it's like here's a brand new mechanic just for the sake of like having a weird mechanic in a game. I don't think it works very well, but okay. Uh, Corey. I mean, I think, I think when it comes to buying a game and actually sitting down at the, at this point in my life with, with kids and, you know, responsibilities. I really do like familiar, you know, I, I really do like having that familiarity. I think it's probably why I play destiny more than anything. Cause it's just literally sitting down to shoot stuff. And sometimes there's a new environment to go, <laughs> go do. Um, but I, I think that like, I don't know, breath of the wild, like really changed a lot for me in the way that I think about and play games too. Right. Like I didn't really care. Breath of the Wild was really the first major open world game that I finished and played. And then I moved on to Assassin's Creed and Horizon, right? Like or, or Assassin's Creed Odyssey is like one of my favorite games of all time, really, because of because of that. And I I think that Zelda really changed a lot, but it still felt familiar because it was Zelda, right? Mm-hmm. In, a, in a way. And there's a lot of familiarity, even though the game is so different from previous entries. Uh, so I think I think the way that they hid 
the innovation and it's something that I already felt familiar with is actually the key for me uh, in trying something new. Um, and I think that's why I'm excited for Tears of the Kingdom because it's, you know, it's Breath of the Wild again. But like, again, there's things about Tears of the Kingdom that I'm actually scared about, right? Like the vehicles. Do we build them? Do we craft them? Are they a major part of the game? Uh, where are we going? Are we going through Hyrule again? You know, I mean, obviously the sky stuff and I, I'm assuming the underground stuff are going to be major parts of the game and Hyrule is just kind of like the landscape. But like, it still feels like, oh man, this, this, this vehicle stuff looks really weird. That, I'm so stuck on the vehicle stuff. I'm like, I just want to run around and shoot stuff and have some new powers. And, you know, okay, the the, the Skybird vehicle things that you ride to the next island. Okay, whatever. You got to get to the next island somewhere, right? But, like, when I saw that big, huge Banjo-Kazooie nuts and bolts <laughs> truck thing that he's driving around like mowing the yard. I'm like, oh, what is going on here? <laughs> what is this game? Did Miyamoto get high and just say, mow the lawn? And they all listen to him like, what is going on in here? So uh, I think I think when it comes to innovation for me, I think it has to be kind of hidden in there. But then like, OK, so you look at something like God of War Ragnarok too, right? And it's like, man, that game is extremely linear. And that game, I'm just like, I'm 50, I was 15 hours and I'm like, I played this like three years ago. I played this exact game. I am so bored playing this <laughs> game that I just stopped playing. And I know that's blasphemy to a lot of people, right? But like God of War Ragnarok is extreme, in my opinion, is extremely overrated. And I would much rather play on PlayStation. I would much rather play Horizon like, or or something of that nature. Uh, just because there's the freedom to move about and the freedom to explore. And, you know, learning a few new things while, you know, using your old tricks that you did in the previous one. So I think as long as you, ha for me, if you find familiarity in the thing and you hide the innovation in unique and interesting ways, to the point where like you don't even realize it until after you're doing it and you're like, Oh, that's incredible. I think that's it for me. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ouch. Uh, what do you choose? You know what? I'm going to spread my bets all across the table so I can't get in trouble. <laughs> you need both. Like when it comes to having traditional gameplay styles, that is completely fine, but is amount of effort and polish that goes into it. Like, Red Dead Redemption 2, Grand Theft Auto, Saints Row. Those are the three same games. Those are the three same games. So in theory, you know, you're wandering through a city. You are using different powers, but they are all separated by certain and specific factors. You know, Red Dead Revolver, you're a cowboy in old times. Complete, like, cr incredibly detailed. Grand Theft Auto, you're a gangster. You're in current times. Really well done. Saints Row, you're freaking crazy and you're jumping all over the place with superpowers. So all of that is good. It just depends on like your level of polish and care and your niche even in certain cases. And then on the other hand, you need innovation just to get something going. Remember, without innovation, you don't have the Nintendo Wii. And the Wii is the one of the most successful products Nintendo has ever put out. At least, you know, I want to say multi, multi millions of hardware and units sold on that. And it's just based on a remote control, which I do not have in front of me. But you just remote control pointing at the screen. People lost their freaking minds over. So you kind of need both. Now, in gameplay, you like it, it takes a really weird turn sometimes like like. The strangest game I have probably ever played, and this is saying a lot, is like Death Stranding. Like, I don't know how people feel about Hideo Kojima. Some people think he's a genius. Some think, he, you know, he's in an art tour with his experiences. It's a walking game. Like, you are learning the balance to through, but you're basically walking across the United States of America. Again, highly polished. Really well done, really deep lore, really good storytelling, and all kinds of weird shit goes on as well, by the way. 
But it's that thing of like, how much is too much? Like some people like will gush over this game. I don't know why it's I got I have to give it an honest play real soon just because you would start the game and it's just like, OK, I have to go to work in an hour. I cannot hit a cut scene and lose 35 minutes on this, Hideo. So it's a balance of both. But I think the main thing is, is it fun? That's the question. If you're having fun from both, I can't front on that. You can like, you can enjoy any crazy Warhammer miniature game with thousands of rules. You can also like tic-tac-toe. Is there fun? Is it fun? Hell yeah, it is. So is that's for me. Give me anything I'll play. If I'm enjoying it and it's well made, it's all good. Uh, well, for me, I'm going to, I go with innovation. I love someone doing something new or uh, taking uh, their spin on something that is considered as tradition and giving a new fresh paint, you know, whether it's within the controls, as level designs, um, as gameplay ideas and stuff. Uh, I'm always looking forward to innovation because I think with tradition, there gets to a point where developers literally get lazy. And when uh, some of them get lazy, a game becomes a washing machine uh, or it literally becomes like paint by the numbers and very cliche and dull. So, I mean, you know, like I'm not going to get on Rockstar. Everybody know how I feel about their games and stuff. So, I I prefer because I always go to Nintendo for innovation. I love when they're innovating with uh, a video game console or handheld, and they're using games to show that innovation. You know that gets me thinking of, you know, if someone could take this idea and do it right and everything, maybe it's going to get them to be more creative and everything. Like, I give it to Sega with Jet Set Radio. That was innovative because cell shading art hasn't been done. But then you look at Nintendo and you take and you put that same art style in Wind Waker, and you literally got two classics. They're both from different companies, but you see that, you know, Nintendo was able to take this cartoon looking game but yet make it bigger than what it was supposed to be. You know, people were just like, oh, I'm not going to buy that game because of the art style. And look at Wind Waker, H- look, not HD, but look at Wind Waker. It's held as one of the best Zelda games and everything. You know, people got past the art style and stuff. You know, with that art style, you are able to add comedy and stuff. You know, and, and games, like, if you weren't playing a Paper Mario game, or anything, you did not have a game that was delivering you comedy. But somehow, Double Fine was able to do it. Valve was able to do it with Portal 2. Um, like, there's other companies who are able to do something with, like, comedy and everything. As, you know, even though that is, like, with writing and stuff, it's innovative that someone was able to put a genre of, you know, into video game form. Because we didn't have comedy or anything in games. Um, I, I look at um, The Last Guardian. Like, that's very innovative because no one was doing what uh, they were doing with that game. Yes, <laughs> um, uh, Trico, he had his mi- a mind of his own and everything. You had to kind of get a feel with treats and everything. But I'm like, who else is doing something like this? And I felt like that's very innovative that uh, they would take Sony would l- allow that company to take a risk and make that kind of game and put it out and everything. So I think with innovate, I, I think with innovation for me is what I'm looking for because even whether it's a success or failure, at least it's something that broke the mold of just um, traditional ga- gaming. You know, of something being too familiar. Like, I, I'm not knocking third person over the shoulder games, but it has got to a point where it's literally, um, it's literally paint by the numbers that any game that's trying to take on it and everything, it's going to get redundant. It's going to get just like, oh, so here goes another fight. I got to do the same thing over and over. There's nothing else that's uh, breaking up this monotone. 
and everything, you know. Um, yeah, you could say the same thing about the Mario games. Like, they get kind of repetitive. But if the level design is there, if they add some different things in there, maybe there is something uh, people could look for. So maybe there is some innovation they put on. I think that's why when Nintendo put in the powers and stuff, like the cat suit, they, they put in, or if you look at Super Mario 3D World, they put in where you're racing. So it feels like a Mario Kart level in some, in some instance and stuff, but it's still challenging and everything. Like, I, I think Nintendo definitely tries to think out the box for some of their games and do something different, you know, and bring some kind of innovation to it. But okay. it Innovation is a double-edged blade. So let me throw a hypothetical at you. Would you buy the Nintendo Wii heart monitor? Yes, I would. Ha, well, well, you know what? You're asking I, the I, wrong I, person that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to I have to bite my tongue because gotta, I just thought of I just thought gotta, of it uh, here. Uh like you know, you look at Twitch streamers, there are heart rate monitors now, which basically that's what that was. So and, they and didn't even have, release that damn thing. So that's how powerful at, Nintendo is. You got to look at the Wii just with the remote control. Sony did move. Uh, when the Wii U came out, Xbox did smart glass. Um, they tried to do, I think they tried to do it with Vita for PlayStation, but I'm not, I'm not sure. You know, when I, think, Nintendo, I think the Vita was already out. Oh, okay. When Nintendo was doing some innovative stuff with their hardware, Microsoft and Sony was trying to do the same thing. Microsoft put out the Kinect. And what was the only game that everybody cared for? It was Dead Central 2. What other game was going big on Xbox 360 with the Kinect? Star Wars? <laughs> no, that wasn't doing anything. I don't know. know. Star Wars Dancing as Han Solo was pretty good. That was a mess of a game. <laughs> you know, like, so, like, Nintendo Nintendo was just like, we're not trying to compete. We're trying to do our own thing. And so, why do you think even with Switch now, everybody was just like, Sony needs to get back into the handheld game? You know, Microsoft have cloud gaming and stuff. And oh my gosh. Oh, go I ahead, wish go I wish Xbox or PlayStation would make another handheld. Like I really do. And not not these third party cloud gaming whatever's. I want like I want an Xbox you want some hardware. As powerful five hundred dollar handheld that I can take with me, right? Like I, I do. I really what? do, you know. Am I the only uh, person who never got into handhelds that much? Like I got, I had like a 3DS in college, and I would do you try to do that Street Pass thing. I think I got I like like one person in college. That was all I could ever find. So I was never huge into like like so saying that you you want a beefy five hundred dollar handheld system to take with you. I'm like, shit, that's an investment. That's not a game console. Well, I think I think I think also too. Like you look at the Steam Deck, and you know it's possible, right? Where like. I can definitely take my Xbox library on the go. I don't want to really invest in a Steam Deck because I I own I think I have like four PC games, right? And mm -hmm. you know, one of, two of them were free to play, and one of them was gifted to me. So you know, I think the only game I've ever bought outright on PC is Roller Coaster Tycoon Classic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, game, me, and me and Corey is just on that level. <laughs> Where's that backwards compatibility for the Roller Coaster Tycoon original Xbox? Come on. I know you made that game. Uh, what about yeah. you? Whoa. Talk about a traditional game you don't have to innovate because it's just perfect already. Roller Coaster Tycoon. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> perfect. Roller Coaster Tycoon 1 and 2, though, not 3. Uh, 3, yeah, not yes. Three. Give, no, give me 3. three. I three, need... can, 3 can fall off no. a and just. I, I need 3 yeah. so I can just make my. Uh, roller coasters in 3D. All I care for is making my roller coasters unlimited without no money and like showing the world that I got some crazy designs. That's all I care for. I don't care about making up the park or anything. No. Give me no, free you gotta, you gotta stick to the hits. No no three. Yeah. Roller Be able to take kill the Give it to me. But see, y'all talking about the campaign. I'm talking about just making roller no. coasters. I just want to make roller coasters. I'm talking no, about dude. Me. The only the only level I ever played in Roller Coaster Tycoon one was uh, was Frontier whatever the first level. And the first thing right. I did. You are talking about the campaign. I'm no, talking about. I'm the only free talking run. about the first level though. I never played the rest of it. I only played that first level because it had the most land, 
and mm-hmm. you could clear it out real easily. And all you had to do was build a park up front that people liked while you took their money and bought the land behind them to build right. the bigger stuff. And I don't care about any of that. I care about the free roaming in three to make oh. roller coasters. That's what I care about. I'm you talking just need about to learn me. how to you need to learn how to run a business, Ed. I don't want to run the business. That's why you I have to, you. You need to have your half price <laughs> half price ice cream cones, okay? <laughs> to get people into the park. <laughs> see see like, the only thing I ever did in roller coaster tycoon. If you there was the launch loop where mm-hmm. it would shoot out in a loop and then just keep on going. We never finished it. So we would just make a launch loop coaster with no track. So it's just like launch, send them oh, crash, 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 crash. And then all you had to do was just demolish it and all the bad press was gone. And you could just keep on doing that over and over and over again. I was terrible to fake people. Yeah, yeah. I it's remember like, dropping people into lakes a lot. Dropping oh, yeah. like the, car, the costume <laughs> like oh, yeah. like picking you, them you, up and dropping them in the water, and then getting the bad press from them drowning. Okay, Corey, now give them worse about that. What? I don't. I don't need to give them any words. It's the same. It's the same reason people drown the Sims in the swimming pools, right? I mean. Oh wow. So you see, I did even worse. I would do even worse in the Sims. I wouldn't even build them a house. Like you just, I would just save the money without building all the walls. It's like here's a pool table, here's a couple beds. Everything got stolen all the time. But wow. you know, save yourself the money. So, yeah, no, I care. I care for making my roller coasters. So I care for. I don't care about anything else. Let me just build roller coasters. That's all I care for. You're that me. person. You are that person. Oh man, roller coaster tycoon. What a game! What a game! Except for the Switch version, that version can also go. Oh goodness, that that, that could drown in the sea. Um, but like when it comes to uh, innovation and traditional, and I will say that there are when games that are innovative and they do become successful, if there is no change to them, they end up becoming traditional games. Um, and True. for some, for some stuff, for some people, that's fine. And everything. Some people don't want to do innovation or anything. If it's if something looks basic and generic, but it feels good, they'll go for it. But like for me, just firstly, I I want more innovative games. I just want some more creativity because I I don't like paint by the numbers and I don't like washing machine games because sometimes I get really bored and dull with them. And it's just and to me if it, it gives all the impression as even though you are a great developer, you'd allow this team to get lazy. And when I think when I feel like a game and the developer team feels like they're lazy, it just feels like you're just copy and pasting just to finish the game and get it out so you can make some sales. Well, I mean, I don't think that's on the developer. I think that's on the publisher. But I think, you know, when we so when we had uh, Celia uh, from Yacht Club on, she was talking about how the AAA space kind of relies on similarity and how the indie space is really the innovative space. Right. And I mean, I think we've kind of all known that to some degree for for a while now, but like. I don't know. Sometimes when you have a developer on and they talk about that kind of stuff, it kind of puts it in a different perspective because they're in the, they're in it. You know, they're really like coding and designing the game and building the levels that you're going to play soon. And hopefully somebody buys their game. And like it, it's I think if you I think that's just kind of what we have to expect now. And I think I think Sony's getting a lot of flack for that right now, where like a lot of their games are pretty samey. You know, mm-hmm. um, and Ed, I know we've kind of actually been talking about that for a long time where like, I mean, yeah, OK, this this over the shoulder semi action RPG is open world and this one is kind of linear and this one has motorcycles and this one has, you know, an Indiana Jones clone, right? Like, but all these different games there, I mean, they're still like the over the shoulder third person action game and you know sony is kind of getting some flack starting to get some flack for that and i i hope in the next couple years they kind of change their tone right but like um i mean microsoft is just not putting games out anyway but i think you look at something like hi-fi rush that they just put out and that's totally different than anything that you would expect someone like bethesda or xbox to put out you know 
which me and Sebastian was just talking about uh about High Five Rush. I I told him like I feel like High Five Rush is a game that screams this is Microsoft. This is a Zenimax and Tango works not at their best, but doing something different that would make you say, okay, this is definitely Microsoft and it only belongs to Microsoft. And I'm happy that they made it because I feel like with Hi Fi Rush, I feel like Nintendo, Sony is that's something that those two companies can't make. Now, the disc to them, they could try if they want to, but I think Hi Fi Rush just screams Microsoft, mm-hmm. which yeah, is great, it- what they needed. And not to get too off topic either, but I think that's what Microsoft's goal is at the end of the day with all these studios is to have that diverse portfolio ready to go, right? Mm -hmm. With stuff like, okay, you have your first person shooter in Halo, you have your third person shooter with Gears, you have your kind of MMO with Sea of Thieves, you have your RPG with Fable eventually, right? You have this these weird little smaller titles like uh psychonauts and hi-fi rush and you have your storytelling game with hellblade and you have your racing game with forza like they have they have they have it they just need to start putting them out exactly so so sorry uh any final words ouch a day i think that if you want to skew traditional as like the developer you run like the really fine line of having the same like if you have the same mechanics every single time you're kind of aiming for that nostalgic gamer and like the line of like hitting that those like same notes again seems impossibly hard so like the level of failure seems like it elevates with every game so like if every fire emblem game was like fire em- like the game boy advance games like you'd have to really nail the themes that made people enjoy the first one every single time if you're not willing to kind of push yourself to try something different so i think it would just really ratchet up that like pass or fail of a game mm-hmm. what about you ouch i think we all can agree microtransactions suck i don't know how else to end this conversation that's that's <laughs> innovation on the bad side so of course, oh, good, you're, t- good. you're telling the person who scans the Destiny store every day for new, for new armor <laughs> sets to buy for fifteen dollars a piece. So you don't have to. You tell can me. justify it. I'm not gonna complain. Oh, there's no justifying. I just want it. <laughs> <laughs> well, everybody, that's gonna be it for jump off point. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Ouch. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Hopefully you guys enjoyed this episode. Uh, but before we go, Daniel, you want to turn uh, tell people a little bit about uh, Turn by Turn podcast, what they can look forward to? Sure. So I host the Turn by Turn podcast where we talk old retro traditional games like JRPGs and SRPGs. And um, uh, do we have a specific episode coming out? We're, uh, we're going to be talking some Dragon Quest V in the next little bit. So I guess keep keep your eyes open for that. Yes. And Ouch, you have some of your own content also. Uh, talk about I it? got a bunch of stuff. You can follow me on all social media. Uh, Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, Twitch, if I ever decide to start streaming again, at Just Ouch, capital J-U-S-T, capital A-E-W-C-H. And check out my podcast, The Ouchcast. Find it on Spotify. Spell it as it sounds. Uh, video game reviews, TV reviews, um, uh, character stuff, uh, personal blogs. What the place where all my brain droppings go? Uh, search the Ouchcast on Spotify, or go to an uh, anchor has now changed, so I'm not sure what it is. Search Ouch on Spotify; it should be one of the first things that comes up. So, Anchor is now Spotify Spotify for podcasters. Yes, and I don't think they've changed any of the URLs yet. So. I have it. It's awful. It's uh, <laughs> why? Why do you change? Why change it? Spotify I, for podcasters does not roll off the tongue like Anchor does. I'm just saying. I'm just throwing it out there. I, I also don't like the color scheme. I was happy with the purple. Now it's just dark purple slash black everywhere. You know, which fire. you can find the Ouchcast on. There we go. Yeah. And uh, Daniel, where can they find Turn by Turn? Uh, we are all over the place. Uh, I guess find us on Apple Podcasts and give us five stars there would probably be the, the nicest thing you could do for us. 
Um, but we're also on Spotify and all kinds of other places that just steal podcasts from other sources. <laughs> and you guys know, George, you can find me and Corey at, so we don't have to plug too much. But don't everybody, find me. don't look for me. <laughs> have a great week. Have a great weekend. And we'll see you next time on Drop Off Point. Bye, everybody. This episode of Jump Off Point is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support the Boss Rush family of podcasts, head to BossRush.net or our Patreon at patreon.com slash BossRushMedia. Thanks for helping us build something better.